morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Monday, June 7th. 2021. And on this episode, I've got what I think is a pretty interesting history les lesson on the revolutionary Lee Resolution, which was introduced today in history on June 7th, 1776 by the great Richard Henry Lee. I'm going to do my best to explain why it was so important in the march to independence, including the Declaration of Independence, of course, less than a month later. I'm going to share a little background from behind that on the Virginia's Fifth Revolutionary Convention. And I want to talk a little bit about the impact of the Lee Resolution. I've got insight from John Adams, James Madison, Samuel Adams, Mercy Otis Warren. I've even got one of them pointing to 1761 as being the date where the beginning of the revolutionary struggle had started. I think you're going to find this really uh, a fun and interesting history lesson. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles, for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage has everything you need to follow this program, all the archives for about three years now on individual episodes like this one today. I publish uh, an individual post on each episode about an hour or so, maybe two hours after the live broadcast is done. And I link to all the stuff that I'm talking about because I'm really just scratching the surface. And I'm hoping that you'll hear something that you want to learn a little bit more about and you'll go through those links and read and learn more in context on your own time. On that show homepage, you can also find all the different platforms. We're on. We, of course, live stream on the mainstream ones like YouTube and Facebook and Twitch and Twitter and the like. And we'll also be uploading an archive version to many different platforms like Gab TV, oftentimes MeWe. They've got some file limitations i got to figure out. For those of you on MeWe, if you know how to get past a 500 gig file limitation, please let me know. Maybe there's an upgrade that I need to do. There's Minds.com, Brighteon, BitChute, BitTube, Hyper, and, man, a bunch of them. And we're also on the podcast edition, audio only at Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and the rest. You can also find our membership program where you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as 2 bucks a month. Again, that show homepage is 10thAmendmentCenter.com slash Path to Liberty. All spelled out, 10thAmendmentCenter.com slash Path path to liberty. And while I'm giving people another moment or so to get notifications to join us on the live stream, uh, a quick hello to everyone out in the live chat. There's Rachel and Tim on YouTube. Appreciate both of you guys. Dixie Strong, Clay Kent, Jim Knowlton catching live. Good to see you, buddy. Appreciate you being here this morning. Murray Ray, that Liberty gal in North Texas. Tyler B, Patricia Dance, and everyone else. I apologize if I miss anybody, but I want to get right to this because it's a pretty meaty history lesson. I'm going to, oh, I also want to say a quick thank you. You know, I mentioned the membership program, two bucks a month. We really do a ton with this. We're actually getting close to our 15 year anniversary, which is later this month. And you might be surprised that I actually would have to look up what the actual date was when I started the organization back in 2006. So now we're looking at 15 years. I wasn't thinking of like, oh, we're going to be celebrating anniversaries. I just wanted to put a message out that there was a line in the sand. That's the 10th Amendment, the Constitution, and everybody left, right and center, no matter who's in power, they always seem to lie about it. They seem to go beyond it. Or when they actually do things that they say they're going to do, they always end up costing a ton more or there's some other unforeseen, unintended, we'll put unintended in quotes, really, uh, consequences. Basically, the Constitution is being crushed all the time. And I wanted to do some uh, outreach and uh, teach people about that problem. Well, it's grown over the years. and I'm very, very grateful for all the support, especially the membership program. Because there really is, even though we've got now somewhere between 10 and 15,000 posts on the website, we've got tons of videos, hundreds and hundreds of videos. I do this podcast. We do all this stuff for free, but of course we couldn't survive if we didn't eat and we weren't able to reach more people. So there's all of this. So of course this the membership program enables us to do this full time. It also enables us to grow and reach and teach more people. And when you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people pitching in at as little as two bucks a month, it really does a lot. So I want to say a quick thank you to a few, just a small handful of people who have joined us as members lately. There's Aaron in Virginia with a lifetime, very generous. Uh, Jennifer here in California, Dale in Kentucky, Violet in Alabama, Lee in Texas. There's a bunch of others. I couldn't be more grateful for your support. Keep in mind, anniversary is somewhere around June 25th, June 26th. I can't remember. It's really the day that I registered 10thamendmentcenter.com. I'm sure I could look that up. Anybody could look that up. And we're going to be doing probably a series of emails if you're subscribed to our newsletter, 
highlighting some of the most important articles and research and work that we've done over the last 15 years, somewhere probably the week before through Independence Day. Anyways, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the support for those of you who are able to kick in and help us financially. And I really appreciate it all. Anyways, let's get right to this. I want to start out with this letter from John Adams to his wife, Abigail Adams, on July 3rd, 1776. And let me just pull this up on the screen. And here's how he put it. He said, the second day of July 1776. And some of you watching or listening to this are not going to be surprised because I've covered this Lee resolution, not in as much detail as today, uh, even though I probably could go way more detail today uh, than I will. But you'll be familiar with what's going on here. But it's, I think it's important to set the stage. The second day of July 1776, he's so excited, will be the most memorable epoca, epoca? epic in the history of America. I am apt to believe, he said, that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be it ought to be commemorated, he wrote, as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other from this time forward forevermore. He was predicting Independence Day celebrations, what they call today as Happy July 4th, <laughs> without actually knowing the history. He thought July 2nd was the day that we were going to remember. And why was that? Well, today in history, on June 7th, 1776, Richard Henry Lee of Virginia, and this is from history.com, introduced a resolution for independence to the second to the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia. John Adams, the Atlas of Independence, he was really railing and pushing for independence, and Abigail was pushing him to go much faster than he even wanted to. She was like hammering. We like she wrote to him at one point. She said, We've got all these high-sounding words about liberty and freedom and no action. What's going on, John? <laughs> you know, she really pushed him hard. And he was very aggressive about this. He was a, a, a strong-minded guy. And here he seconded that motion. And Lee's resolution, this is what it declared, on June 7th, 1776. It actually passed on July 2nd, 1776, which is why Adams thought that this was going to be Independence Day. Here's the resolution. I'll read it. It's very short. That these united colonies are, and of right, ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. That measures should be immediately taken for procuring the assistance of foreign powers and a confederation be formed to bind the colonies more closely together. The day before, oh, here I just have a, an actual original image of this Declaration of Independence. The Lee Resolution is what we call it today. Introduced June 7, 1776, passed July 2nd. Uh, it's very short compared to Jefferson's draft and what came out of the Committee of Five. Here on June 6th, this is from Harvard, uh, Harvard something, declaration.fas. I'll link to it. On June 6th, they write, knowing that Richard Henry Lee would be presenting his resolution the next day, Samuel Adams wrote, and of course, Maybe Richard Henry Lee was telling everybody, but we do know that Richard, Samuel, and John were really tight, especially Richard and Samuel. And there's an interesting uh, uh, book that covers some of this as well. I don't have the title off the top of my head. I'll see if I can link to it in the show notes, talking about how these two came from such different backgrounds, the Bostonian merchants versus you know the landed gentry in Virginia. You'd think that they wouldn't be such great friends, but they had very similar principles and they connected very strongly. So Samuel Adams wrote this, this will, in my opinion, be an important summer, productive of great events, which we must be prepared to meet. If America is virtuous, she will vanquish her enemies and va establish her liberty. Now, of course, Samuel Adams always had a tinge of morality and virtue in what would become uh, the possibility for liberty. No matter what you would set up as far as the structure of government, and I think this is a pretty good, uh, a pretty good warning. It doesn't matter what you set up. If you don't have a good, moral, virtuous people, and if, uh, no, we don't want to force morality or virtue on anybody, of course. But if you don't have a good people, of course, they're going to be corrupt and push their government to do corrupt things anyways or allow them to get away with it. So Samuel Adams was obviously pretty right. That was a very important summer in 1776. 
Now, here to Wikipedia, they're just an overview of the Lee resolution. They say it's named for Richard Henry Lee of Virginia, who proposed it to Congress ever after receiving instructions and wording from the Fifth Virginia Convention and its president, Edmund Pendleton. Lee's full resolution had three parts. You heard me read through them, but this is a nice breakdown, which were considered by Congress on June 7th, 1776, along with the independence issue. I like how it's fascinating, the independence issue, as if it wasn't some kind of monumental historical thing. But along with independence, it also proposed to establish a plan for ensuing American foreign relations. They knew they were going to be independent, so they drafted up or they the resolution called to create foreign relations, foreign policy treaties with other countries because they're independent and prepare a plan of confederation for the states to consider. Congress decided to address each of these three parts separately. So we have to go back to the Fifth Virginia Convention to understand how did we get to this independence? There were a lot of calls to build up to independence. There were resolutions locally on a state level as well or on a colony level in the drive to July 4th. And here again from Wiki, the 5th Virginia Convention was a meeting of the Patriot Legislature of Virginia held in Williamsburg from May 6th to July 5th, 1776. You can see in like history texts, sometimes it's called the 5th Virginia Convention, sometimes it's the 5th Virginia Revolutionary Convention. I like the latter. A little background on that convention. Here from uh, University of Virginia, they say many of the delegates at the 5th Convention brought instructions from their localities. And the reason I think this is important is because even though they weren't binding instructions, this started out on a very local level. And I've done another episode that I'll mention briefly in just a few moments, talking about how much of the push for declaration for independence really did come down to a very local level. In fact, there was even a merchant group up in New York who had a call for independence in New York State. And so here they say many of the delegates brought instructions from their localities to declare Virginia independent of Great Britain. They were like they wanted everyone to be together, but Virginia was going to go it alone if they had to. As their first order of business, they elected Edmund Pendleton president of the convention. And on May 14th, the debate on independence began. There was no question that the ties between Virginia and Great Britain would be dissolved. They were fully on board. This was going to happen. Virginia was totally there. There was only one person in opposition, a guy named Robert Nicholas Carter, who I know absolutely nothing about other than that. But there were varying opinions on how best to preserve liberty and win the clash with British forces. This is a very important strategic note. Even though you have an ultimate goal, and I talk about this a lot on almost everything that we work on in our study of history and our talks about Jefferson's strategy, Madison's strategy, you can't always just go for the end zone on every single play. You have to actually think, what is the status quo? What's What are the events on the ground? Like, they were fully on board. I don't know what the numbers were, 49 to 1, basically. Only one person in the entire General Assembly in Virginia was actually a opposed to independence. So they all wanted to do it. And the debate was really over. Well, do we need to go it alone? Should we instruct our representative in the Second Continental Congress, our representatives, to propose independence, to work with the other colonies? Do we make treaties with those other colonies as independent states, free and independent states? So that was really what the debate was about. And in the end, the convention passed a unanimously, and I'm not sure if that guy Nicholas actually, Robert Nicholas Carter, I had to look his name up again, I'm not sure if he abstained, but it was a unanimous vote. On May 15th, the convention declared that the government of Virginia as, quote, formerly exercised by King George in Parliament was totally dissolved. So you get the language in the Lee resolution actually came from the Virginia Convention. So they declared that the the relationship between Virginia and King George in Parliament was totally dissolved in light of the king's repeated injuries and his, quote, abandoning the helm of government and declaring us out of his allegiance and protection. The convention adopted three resolutions. One, calling for a declaration of rights in Virginia. This is a very important one. I should probably do an episode just on the Virginia Convention, this fifth revolutionary convention in Virginia. They got the Declaration of Rights. We know 
George Mason's hand was involved there. And we know that James Madison's proposal for the Bill of Rights some years later was really heavily based on George Mason's work back in 1776. So they got a Declaration of Rights, one calling for the establishment of a Republican constitution. Of course, they had to make their own government because they weren't or their own constitution because they weren't going to be part of whatever charter happened before that. And a third one calling for, for federal relations with whichever other colonies would have them and alliances with whichever foreign countries would have them. Basically, peace with everyone, peace and trade, peace and commerce. You hear this type of thing from Thomas Jefferson and others many decades later or many years later. This should be our policy. And this is the approach that they took there in middle 17 or May of 1776. It also instructed the delegates to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia to declare independence. So they were they're done. They're out. So Virginia has basically seceded from the empire at that point. So they voted unanimously on that. And we also got this. This was from the preamble. I'll include the full text in the show notes. The preamble and resolution of the Virginia Convention on May 15, 1776. This was really the only positive instruction that they gave to their congressional delegation. This was the only thing. You have to do this. Resolved unanimously that the delegates appointed to represent this colony in general Congress be instructed to propose to that respectable body to declare the United Colonies free and independent states, absolved from all allegiance to or dependence upon the crown or parliament of Great Britain. Here's how James Madison described it. This was his correspondence for the day. He said, Williamsburg residents marked the occasion by taking down the Union Jack. So this was a it was a celebration. People actually recognized that Virginia was a free and independent state on its own at that time, May 15th, 1776. They took down the Union Jack from over the colonial capital and ran up a continental Union flag, keeping the Union Jack of the British Empire in the Canton and adding the 13 red and white stripes of the self-governing British East India Company. So that was pretty momentous for that point. I actually did an episode talking about this type of thing happening because the Declaration of Independence wasn't just from Congress. The reason it really happened, even though there were people like John Adams who was really pushing for it for quite some time, Abigail and others, it really took a kind of a grassroots movement to make it palatable, ready time for action. And in this other episode that I've got linked to here on May 7th of this year, those other declarations of independence, I covered some research from Pauline, the late great Pauline Mayer and a number of other people about the fact that there were somewhere between 90 and 100 local resolutions calling for independence in the months leading up to July 4th, 1776. The reason is when you do that and you show that each community or each colony has their support for this, it becomes more likely for the representatives on a larger scale to actually do something. And in fact, that's a strategy that I think a lot of people should take today. I know you have heard me talk about my opposition to a lot of local so-called sanctuary resolutions. If you listen to this program on a regular basis, if not, you can probably do some research and find where I'm hammering on that episode after episode after episode. The reason is is, is because they, a lot of times when they're using this type of approach, which we actually see is very successful in the run-up to independence, they're not following the same path. They knew in many of those places, the people who were passing those recognized them as a non-binding resolution, as a way to build support, to build momentum, to push things forward. Today, we hear people saying that a non-binding resolution creates a sanctuary when it really creates nothing in law at all, and it's just kind of mixing two strategies, and I think it's a lot of political grandstanding. That's a quick side note. Anyways, this other episode, I think, is pretty interesting. It just doesn't get a lot of uh, listeners listeners or viewers, but maybe, uh, maybe you'll be really interested as well. I thought it was a really great episode. Anyways, back to June 7th. They had to sit on it for weeks. And in fact, I actually read that the initial debate was so hostile that uh, President, I think he was president of the um, Second Continental Congress, John Hancock at the time, he actually tabled it and set the debate again for July 1st. And that's where we end up with July 2nd. And here from History.com, they say, during the ensuing debates, it became clear, and this was on right on June 7th, today in history, it became clear that New York... New Jersey, 
Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, and South Carolina were as yet unwilling to declare independence, but would likely be ready to vote in favor of a break with England in due course. And that's why Hancock was like, look, if we're going to do this, it's got to be unanimous. We've got to have everybody on board. And that's why they decided to hold off. They had some a heavy debate. They found out what the opposition was, the concern. So they started forming three different committees. And here on June 11th, this is from our documents.gov, on June 11th, 1776, Congress appointed three concurrent committees in response to the Lee resolution. So the Lee resolution was serious business. It hadn't, it was only an initial debate on it. It hadn't even passed. And they're like, well, this is something we're definitely going to work on. So let's get some committees and propose debate and vote on each of these three things in this resolution that came from the fifth Virginia Revolutionary Convention in May of 1776. So they had three committees. There was a committee of five that we're aware of to draft a declaration. That's John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman, and Robert Livingston. Then there's a second one to draw up a plan for forming foreign alliances. Of course, they're going to be an independent state or... <laughs> 13 free and independent states, or maybe 12. We'll see how that plays out. And that was another committee to do foreign relations. That's John Dickinson, Benjamin Franklin, John, Adaman, John Adams, Benjamin Harrison, and Robert Morris. That was the second committee. And then there was another committee, a third committee, to draft up a first constitution, the Articles of Confederation, something that we really need to cover much more here at 10th Amendment Center, because that so much of what they debated for the Constitution came from their experience in that period where they had the Articles of Confederation. We have to we have to understand that history to understand what was going on, the support, the opposition. And we definitely don't do enough, but it is in my head. And I know we're starting to do more and more, but we're going to really ramp that up in the years to come. So this other committee to uh, draft an Articles of Confederation, that was headed by John Dickinson, but it was one one delegate from each state or each colony. So that was to prepare and digest the form of a confederation. But when it came down to a vote, actually, New York, uh, New York actually had to abstain. So the vote was finally, they, they went through this process and they were going to consider each of these parts of the resolution separately. So on July 1st, debate came up again. South Carolina said, well, let's hold back for another day. We need it to be unanimous. They voted on July 2nd. New York actually abstained because they did not have instructions on what to do. So their delegation did Absolutely nothing. I think they actually followed up in support maybe by the 9th. I forget. Yeah, here it is. New York cast no vote on the newly elected uh, New York Convention until the New York Convention upheld the declaration on July 9th, 1776. So there was a unanimous vote in support of this Lee resolution. This was a declaration of independence. Twelve colonies voted yes on July 2nd, 1776. And John Adams was so excited about this. I started out this episode with this letter he wrote to Abigail Adams on July 3rd. The very next day, he sends out a letter. He's like, this is going to, this is monumentous. We are going to have celebrations all through history, remembering shows and cannons and lighting up the sky. So fireworks, really. All from coast to coast, all through history for July 2nd. And he wrote a second letter. I'll get to that in just a moment. But on the evening of July 2nd, 1776, right off the bat, and if you think about the nature of publishing a newspaper, the Pennsylvania Evening Post was the one to break the news that night. So they voted yes, 12 that day. But everything's all set. The presses are all set. And the only thing that they could actually include was kind of like something near the end. And I've actually got this up here on the screen. It's actually right by the classifieds, in essence. They're going to be selling... Uh, they're selling something. They put one little line at the very end that they were able to squeeze in. And it said, this day... The Continental Congress declared the United Colonies free and independent states. And there were some other papers that started to pick up on this the following day going forward. So here, even the local press, which I don't think was an enemy of the people at that point, uh, at least not the Pennsylvania Evening Post, declared July 2nd. Today, Continental Congress declared us free and independent states. And here is the um, other, the second letter that John Adams wrote on the same day. He was all done, fired it off, 
probably sealed it. And now he's like, I got to write some more. And here he put it this way. Yesterday, the greatest question was decided, which was ever debated in America. And a greater, perhaps, never was or will be decided among men. A resolution was passed without one dissenting colony that these United States colonies are of are and of right ought to be free and independent states. And as such, they have and of right ought to have full power to make war, conclude peace, establish Congress, commerce and to do all the other acts and things which other states may rightfully do. And he was expecting in the next few days a formal declaration which would set forth the causes. So he saw the declaration of which he was on the Committee of Five to draft that up with Thomas Jefferson and others. He saw that as just to explain the causes, even though looking back on history, most of us consider it as the actual declaration, which happened on on July 2nd. And then he points out, as I mentioned right at the beginning, 1761, he says, when I look back to the year 1761 and recollect the argument concerning writs of assistance in the Superior Court, which I have hitherto considered as the commencement of the controversy between between Great Britain and America, and run through the whole period from that time to this, and recollect the series of political events, the chain of causes and effects, I am surprised at the suddenness as well as greatness of this revolution. And of course, he's talking about the great speech from James Otis Jr. I think it was about a five hour speech railing against the writs of assistance back in 1761. And John Adams actually marked that and pointed to he didn't mention Otis there. Of course, everyone knew who he was talking about. The other great Bostonian. He recognized that as the turning point, the beginning of the revolution. We know that years later, Adams wrote to Hezekiah Niles, 1818, I think, and he talked about how the revolution wasn't the war. The revolution, he said, happened years before the war commenced. It was a change in the minds, the hearts, the political, religious sentiments of the people, their relationship between them and their government. That was he, what he called the real American Revolution. And here from Dave Benner's great article on this, which we uh, share every year on the, uh, we'll probably share it on July 2nd, again, totally dissolved, the Lee in the, the Lee Declaration and the, the Lee Resolution. I apologize, I'm rushing through this. Totally dissolved, the Lee Resolution and the Declaration of Independence by Dave Benner. He put it this way, upon the decision to secede from the British crown, and I like that Dave always hammers home that this was an act of secession. A somber mood swept through Independence Hall as the delegates realized their actions would be considered treasonous. They all knew what was going on, and it still passed unanimously. He said, despite the prospect of death by hanging, the decision had been made. Historian Mercy Otis Warren, we call her the muse of the American Revolution, wrote this account of the event. And here's how she put it. Their transactions might have been legally styled treasonable. But loyalty had lost its influence and power its terrors. Firm and disinterested, intrepid and united, they stood ready to submit to the chances of war and to sacrifice their devoted lives to preserve inviolate and transmit and to transmit to posterity the inherent rights of men conferred on all by the God of nature and the privileges of Englishmen claimed by Americans from the sacred sanctions of compact. Again, she's talking about natural rights as the foundation for which independence was based on. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. I hope it was a, a fun romp through this kind of very brief overview history lesson. Of course, if you like and support the show, you can help us spread the word by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, primarily in the archives, leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform, subscribe, get notifications, do all that stuff because it tells the algorithm of the platform to show the program to more people. And I couldn't be more grateful for that help because we are reaching more and more people every single month with this show. And of course, as I mentioned right at the outset, our membership program starts out as little as two bucks a month. We also have some annual ones where we have this great revolutionary quote uh, on it from uh, John Dickinson, the penman of the, Re of the revolution, Concordia res parve crescunt. It means small things grow great by concord. Again, our membership program is over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. I will check through the, the comments a little bit later today and reply to as many as possible as I'm able to. Feel free to email me if you've got suggestions for future shows or leave in the comments. 
team at 10thamendmentcenter.com. I hope you had a great weekend. I hope you enjoyed the show. I really appreciate you kicking off your week with me, and I'll see you next time here on The Path to Liberty.